Thanks for coming out. Welcome. Uh, I'm looking around. Declare we have a quorum so we can start official business. Uh, just wanted to welcome everybody out. Uh, thank you for being here today. I want to particularly thank Jim Harris for putting together the minutes from last meeting. Uh, Marissa, who's always there in the background working on stuff. Marissa, shout out. She does a great job really helping uh, keep the trains run on time. Thank you very much, Marissa, and coordinating all the agenda items and everything else. And we've got tech folks from uh, DNR here, Jen and Seth in the back. Thank you for your help. Um, we have increasingly a lot of people participate online in this meeting, and it's great to have them here to make sure that that works well. So historically, we've gone around and we've done introductions to start out. Um, uh, we'll do them just quick, kind of do your name and affiliation. And mostly the reason for doing this is the purpose of Great Salt Lake Advisory Council is to bring people together. So if you hear that somebody has an affiliation and you're interested in what they're doing, then it provides an opportunity uh, for you to talk. We are, this is our second meeting where we have liaisons um, from different watershed councils and other groups present with us. We'll have a couple of them give a little more in-depth introduction here in just a minute, but um, we've got liaisons seated at the table. We don't quite have the name cards for liaisons, but we're working on that. So just tell us if you're if you're a member of the council or your liaison, tell us what your affiliation is. And uh, Leland, why don't we start with you and we'll go around in a circle like that, the table, and then we'll go to the audience. My name is Leland Myers. I'm just going to shout because I don't know how to push the button. And I'm a sewer person. Uh, my name is Tyler Smith. I am not a sewer person, but happy to sit next to one. Um, so I'm the uh, military uh, installation liaison, um, work for the Utah Department of Veterans and Military Affairs, and I'm also representing the Great Salt Lake Sentinel landscape currently until we hire a coordinator, which is coming up quick. Thanks. I'm Jeff Richards. I represent the migratory bird production areas, which are uh, primarily private lands that are owned um, and managed for wetlands. Uh, I'm Brad Perry. I currently serve as the vice chair person for the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation. I am the liaison for the tribe, um, considering this is our Aboriginal territory. Thanks. My name is McKinley Smoot. I'm a uh, the liaison with the Weaver Watershed Council and a rancher from Summit County. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jessica Wade, and I uh, represent the Bureau of Land Management. I'm the field manager for Salt Lake Field Office. I'm Joe Havasey. I re represent extractive industry. I work for Compass Minerals. I'm Megan Nelson with the Nature Conservancy, the conservation representative, and I'm here as an alternate for Elizabeth Kitchens today. Ryan Doherty, uh, representing Tooele County. I'm Dina Blaze on the council representing Salt Lake County. Jim Harris, the Division of Water Quality. I'm Marissa Weinberg. I'm with the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. I'm Ben Nadolski. I'm the Ogden City Mayor and uh, new representative representing the elected official for Weber County. Good morning. I'm Susie. I'm the program manager over Utah Lake and Jordan River. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tim Davis. I'm the Deputy Great Salt Lake Commissioner. Good morning, Laura Vernon, uh, Division of Water Resources. <laughs> Good morning, Lynn DeFredos, Friends of Great Salt Lake. R. Jeffrey Hicks, Utah Air Boat Association. Hi there, my name is Maria Moncur, and I am here as the PR for the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Craig Miller with the Utah Division of Water Resources. Robert Creer, a volunteer for Water for the West. Randy Zollinger with Corolla Engineers, also a sewer person. Mark Reynolds with US Magnesium. Jan Streifel, League of Women Voters. Mondo Masson, Central Davis Sewer. Jill Burton, Policy Director at DEQ. Lily Waterlin with SWCA Environmental Consultants. Steve Erickson, Great Basin Water Network. I'm also a participant in the West Desert Watershed Council. 
Uh, Casey Root, uh, Utah uh, Water Science Center, part of the USGS. Jeff Denbleicher with Jacobs Engineering. I think we got everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is uh, Ben Nadalski's, uh, I won't say it's your first rodeo, Ben, but it's your first time here in the capacity as a member of the council. Uh, and uh, Ben and I go way back to trout days, fishy, fishy business. <laughs> but I, I thought, Ben, just because you've just been confirmed by the Senate, if you could give us just maybe a little bit uh, more just in terms of your background and uh, perspective as you, as you uh, be on the, sitting on the council moving forward. Thanks, Tim, and thanks everybody for having me. Um, just in the sake of wanting to fit in, I'm, I actually represent Ogden City on the sewer board locally, so I'm a sewer guy as well in some way. Um, in other ways, I think we're all sewer people in one way or another. So, um, so before being the Ogden City mayor, I was elected um, in fall of 2023 and sworn in in January 2024. I was I actually had a 23 year career with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and worked a lot with sister divisions at the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, my background is in uh, primarily in, in specialty is in fisheries biology. Um, it's not very often, I guess, that we elect a, a fish biologist to be a mayor, but here I am. Um, but the Great Salt Lake is something that I've been passionate about my entire career. Uh, and it's something that I didn't want to say goodbye to when I, when I changed my career. Um, I really enjoyed all of the varied interests around the, the watershed. I also really enjoyed um, the collaboration and the partnership of the various users in the, that, that have a, an, a, an effect and also who are affected by the decisions regarding the Great Salt Lake. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I hope I can bring some helpful perspective. I'm uh, not a hyper-political or partisan guy by nature. I'm a very um, collaborative guy by nature, and I hope to bring that to the to the council, um, as well as uh, not just my fisheries background, but before I left the division, I supervised operations in northern Utah, which included the Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program. Um, spent a lot of time doing river restoration. Uh, I've got a master's degree from uh, Utah State, took some classes from Wayne Wurzbaugh and others, and so um, I'm quite familiar with a lot of the players and the, uh, the people that are at the table and, and in the watershed. Uh, and I'm excited to still have a foot in the watershed uh, in this kind of work, even though I'm the mayor, I think it's important that we do both. Thanks, Ben. Great to have you here. We need somebody to help us referee the notorious food fights that we have here on the council. So it's great to have you there. I also want to acknowledge it's uh, too difficult to sort of run through everybody that's online um uh to do that sort of expeditiously but just uh recognize you know I, I see a couple of our liaisons here including warren who's going to talk in just a minute wayne wurtz has done a lot of research in the wake ben abbott who's very actively engaged on great Salt lake issues and and many others and is a is a watershed liaison too right ben so um we got a lot of folks uh, a lot of folks online uh joining us and would like to welcome them as well so um we're going to have a couple of our watershed liaisons do a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of the perspective they represent. But before we get to that, I want to just sort of tee up for the council. Um, we have every year $125,000. It comes out of the brine shrimp royalty, and the council has the ability to direct that funding. Historically, we've used it to kind of close the gap and really in partnership. That's not a lot of money. Um, to fund a, a ton of research, but it's really good to sort of close the gap funding or partner funding for a variety of you know critical questions or reports or all kinds of different things that we've done over time. And so one of the things that this uh, that the council heard and approved last year was a proposed uh, study from uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, basically, would would spearhead this, but it's really to understand. Uh, mineral and mineral extraction, the movement of minerals in the lake, how's that affected by the causeway, um, the causeway breach and berm, and really look into that. And so that's been presented at the council. We actually approved it for funding last year. And the idea was that we had about 26, correct me if I'm wrong, Marissa, about 26,000 left in our account last year. And we were going to put it to this, but this took enough time to put together that we've gone into the next fiscal year. And our money lapses. So if it's not obligated, 
just lapses back. So we're basically on a new $125,000 uh, pool of money. And one of the questions that when we get down to committee action that I'd like us to think about and consider is we want to reauthorize that money or a similar amount of money to help this study move forward. So we can discuss it later, but I just wanted to tee it up so that you're, you're thinking about it when we get to that point in the agenda. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. So let's move then. Uh, we've got Brad here with us in person, Brad, and we asked Brad to just sort of uh, give us really uh, his perspective. Again, a new uh, liaison who was with us this last meeting, and so we've asked um, Brad, I think you've got a little bit of a presentation, right? Um, to give us a little bit more perspective um, Kind of the liaison's perspective, if you will. And then after Brad's done, we're going to go to Warren Peterson, who's online, and Warren's going to give us a, an agriculture perspective. Okay, so it's, I'll turn it over to you, Brad. Thanks. Uh, so I, I represent the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation. Uh, my career was spent 20 years with the Bureau of Reclamation, most of that time in the water quality program of the Basin Wide Salinity Control Forum and program and so i've had a lot of experience in water quality and water quantity and in 2018 the tribe purchased um back its most sacred area which is which is uh referred to as you know it bo ogoy or but we call it wuda ogwa because that's that's a little bit le less sacred to use um for for these sorts of things and so we want to develop that project um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, so just a little Shoshone culture is, it, how you pronounce Shoshone is Susagoy, uh, or the people who travel by foot. You know, we lived in the extended areas. Um, we followed the Bear River and the Snake River, but the Bear River was probably the most important uh, river um, that, that, we, that we contacted with because when people ask me, well, how'd you travel? We followed the river. You know, we followed it straight to the Great Salt Lake. We followed it um, up and around in, in other areas. You can go to the next slide. Um, so when you buy your land back, what do you do? You know, it's grazing, you don't graze. Um, it's, it's literally a uh, cemetery, a Civil War massacre site, um, a cemetery, if you will. Um, so we we decided that you know for the, for the help of just our land and and going forward to restore restore the site as possible as before people came in so as natural as possible you can go to the next slide that's just a photo an older photo of the site um, you can kind of see um, that's the massacre area uh, the Bear River in the background and you channelize. Um, Battle Creek. Um, it used to be called Finger Creek back in the 1860s. Uh, it's been channelized and runs, you know, a mile, for a mile or a mile and a quarter uh, into the Bay River. Um, so we took a look at this and we said our ancestors would have looked at this and never camped here. So it's hard to tell our story um, about that. Can you go to the next slide? Um, just because it is historical. Um, January 29th, 1863, uh, the Army marched from Fort Douglas and Salt Lake City and um, uh, descended upon uh, the camp, uh, killing upwards of 500 people. Um, it took us a long time to get this land back, but you can see that it's, it's a very sacred place to us. And that kind of gets us started on how we got involved with all of you moving forward with the watershed in the Great Salt Lake. Go to the next slide. This is an aerial shot of what we call, Wuda Ogwe is just a literal translation of Bear River. Um, Wuda Bear um, Ogwe River. And you can just see kind of the outlines of the, the areas that we own and, and control and, and have ideas for. So we, we took a look at the site in 2019 uh, a year, year or so after we bought it and just said, what do we do? What do we do with this site? What will be helpful? Um, so you can go forward, please. 
So we came up with a project task list, just a phase one. And you can see what we had put in there, you know, a vegetation inventory, what grew there, you know, what's what what riparian zones do we have? What's going on? There's hot springs there. That's why we camped there. Um, we knew that we had hundreds of thousands of Russian olive and other invasive species. Um, we needed to develop uh, ponds and wetlands uh, and begin to plant and with native species, um, monitoring, just kind of getting everything. And everything was put into a conservation easement. Um, and so we've started this and we're three fourths of the way finished. Um, we have about 20 acres of Russian olive to go, which will be our hardest because it's in kind of a swampland area. Um, but we've done, we've done all of these things. And this is what the tribe wanted to do. This is what we looked at. And then in 2020, after we had designed and, and asked for this, a lot, of, a lot of things started coming out of the Great Salt Lake. So could you go to the next slide, please? So you can see just kind of some of the maps and things just, oh yeah, we have this. And we we decided on the Great Salt Lake, it's like, well, we're the last user on our system before it enters the river. Why don't we just release out? Let it meander its way back up the east and flood and just kind of flow and, and get in there. Can you go to the next slide? So we came up with a phase two. And this was strictly to look at and how to augment water in the Bear River to flow to the Great Salt Lake. Also, water quality. Um, we've already we've we've done piping on two laterals of our land. It used to take eight turns to water our field, and now it takes three turns. Um, so we've significantly, you know, gone down. Uh, we're in the we're in the beginning stages of, of building this diversion. Um, the planning and the design of North Battle Creek. We just put a BDA or a Beaver Dam analog in there um, just recently, and we're still have on track to create those natural. It says river, but creek creek um, braids. And then the bank stabilization is, you know, banks are falling in and we, we've started a water quality and a water uh, monitoring program. So these were things that were directly tied to how do we get more water to the Great Salt Lake and still be within our culture. It's cool when both things match. This is culturally what we would do, but it's also what it would be necessary to do to to heal, heal an area. And like I said, the Bear River is very sacred to us. If you can go. So now, I know this one's a little harder to see. So now, with the design. Excuse me, Farmington Bay, we can't hear you online when you walk away from the mic. Oh, sorry. So you can kind of see through there, this is the, the other map. We have a fully designed uh, creek braid system with wetlands ponds that you can see there. You know, the purple is where uh, more Russian olive trees need to come out. Um, you can see the, some of the planting zones or the riparian zones that we have or we're replanting. Um, on the, on the, let's see, it's on your left side, we've added a series of other ponds. We, we investigated our water rights. We have two springs up above that are just going in and cutting out the side hill that we want to bring down and we want to create a series of wetlands ponds that empty back into the Bear River. Our goal is to try to get as much possible. Our goal is 13,000 acre feet a year to the Great Salt Lake. That's what we committed to the governor and to the lieutenant governor. Can you go ahead, please? Because we know the Dichipagani or it, the Dichipagani just means the home of the bad water. That's what we used to call the Great Salt Lake or the Salt Lake Basin. Um, when the Mormon pioneers moved in and Brigham Young had several different homes that he would visit, you know, one every night, we renamed it Shokani or many homes. They, did, they couldn't figure out why one guy needed so many houses. Then they explained polygamy and we, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, so, so that's, that's our goal. Um, can you go forward? So, you know, in our activities, a vegetation inventory, we took what was there. We know it's native and that's what we're trying to replant. We planted 10,000 native plants last year 
this November 1st and 2nd, we've ordered over 50,000 native plants to be put back in. And they were all put in by volunteers. Can you go ahead? You can see the riparian study, uh, well, the vegetation study, I, it's too small to see, but you can kind of see how we, we did different areas and, and what's not supposed to be there and what we can plant there. Can you go ahead? So Russian olive is another one. If you look online, it'll, it'll tell you that a Russian olive tree can take up to 75 gallons of water a day out of the system. Um, there's several sources. We don't know how true that is. Um, we don't calculate it that way. We, we do a lot lower, but we have a couple, at least 250 to 350,000 of these things growing. So that's a before you can go and that's after. Can you go ahead? This is what we're going to tackle starting this year. Um, that's 20 acres of just nothing but Russian olive in a swamp next to the river. The revegetation of the areas, we've, we've, like I said, we've started to plant, um, you know, plants that are sacred to us and, and, and how we can use them. Can you go forward? And this is just our planting. You know, we have uh, bull, bull rush, cattail marsh, say, sedge and rush meadow, willows, cottonwoods, um, cattails. I mean, we're doing, we're doing the things that we can right now. Um, because as we remove the Russian olive, we replant the native species. You know, if you want, if you want to create something that your ancestors would re remember, you got to put this stuff back. Go ahead. So willow or suhavi, um, you can see it's probably our more, most important plant. We always camped around willows. Um, because you could use them for various things. Medicine, cattails are CP, um, also extremely important and what's being put there. Uh, this was, was the old earthen canal. We were estimating about 65% of, of loss. We think now that we were able to measure the water, we were losing about 75% as it was meandering through these dirt canals. You can go ahead. And so we've, we've piped it and we put it at the edge. This is, that's the start of kind of where the braids, the meanders and braids would start. So eventually we're just going to open those gates and just augment the Battle Creek itself. And so we have additional water to augment Battle Creek. And we did two of, we did two of these. Um, one is further, further upstream. You're good. Uh, yeah, just that, that right there. Take a look at the water. Um, this was during the runoff of, in 2023. Um, we, we have measuring. It, it, this, was a, this was a couple days after we measured 175 CFS where it had jumped. And, you know, the water quality and, and, uh, and the flooded out the road and different things. And, you know, we realized, hey, if we would have had the meanders here, we wouldn't have had these these issues can you go ahead and just kind of a map kind of looking at that go ahead so the creation of the natural braids and meanders that's water quality that's 100 percent water quality of why we would do that um if you you know bonneville cutthroat trout used to thrive there if you know anything about bonneville cutthroat trout you know that they like almost drinking water level of types of water, pristine. Go ahead. The bank stabilizations, the you know these hills that are falling in to the to the Bear River again. Something spiritual for us. We need to create our hot springs, but our culture collides with good practices for river restoration and and creek restoration. Go ahead. And this is what's left of our hot springs. Um, we, they used to be fanned out all over, um, but when the water was canaled and channelized, we have a, a little spot that remains. It's 195 degrees, so people always ask, can I go sit there? And I'm like, go ahead. Um, but here's what, it, here's what the temp is, so you can go ahead. The ponds and wetlands, we had started out with just 50, 15 acres of wetlands creation. 
we've since upped that to 60 is our now our new goal uh, of wetlands and restoration. So go ahead. This isn't the, the analog that we put in. This was something that a previous beaver had there. And then when 175 CFS went, so did that. And uh, so we've put uh, a BDA in, in around that same spot in our canal to begin to back up, check the water, start the pure, you know, filtration system and, and, and be able to start managing the water correctly. Go ahead. So you can see our monitoring stations. Um, we've, we've measured, we've measured the NTUs or turbidity um, at 5,000 NTUs. Um, so drinking water is five NTUs. So this is 5,000. Um, if you know anything about the Dolores River in Colorado, we're getting close. Um, known as a fairly, fairly turbid river. Um, and so we're doing these studies and we're, we're engaging in trying to measure the quality and the quantity of the water. No one's ever done it in the area before. We have four different stations um, that start at the beginning and then at the end. You go ahead. Uh, like I said, the, when we got involved with, with uh, people for the Great Salt Lake, you know, we had to come up with an estimation and we worked with Procter and Gamble and their uh, Bonneville Environmental Foundation and, and calculated rates. And currently we've been at, the average for the year was 15 CFS. So we put in 15 CFS at so many acre feet per day. And you can see the 10,800 acre feet. Now our goal is 13,000. Well, we have those other springs and ponds and what we'll work in is the calculation for a Russian olive. We want to be able to drill down on that. We believe that we can return 13,000 acre feet to the Bear River that could uh, essentially go to the Great Salt Lake. Go ahead. This is what it's been looking like. This is our goal. And, you know, it, it's upstream, so it, it, would, it would benefit everybody going downstream. And so, you know, we always ask people to invest in our in our project because we'll we'll send Idaho water to Utah, and uh, you you guys can use that uh, for certain things. But anyway, that's that's just kind of our realization is is our culture is deeply enmeshed in with saving the Great Salt Lake, saving Bear River, saving watersheds, having clean water, having more water, um, having plants and animals and fish that survive. Is there any questions? Thanks, Brad. It's a great presentation. Sobering history, too. Just really interesting that pivot that you've done, right? From a historic tragedy to really trying to do something uh, remarkable in terms of giving back. So thanks for that. Thanks. Any any quick questions for, for Brad? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Really appreciate it. We're now going to go to Warren Peterson, who's online. Uh, Warren, I don't know if you have slides or if you're just going to talk, but uh, the... um, we have an option. Uh, Marissa, do you want to run slides or should I bring them up? Okay. Uh, I think Marissa's got them, Warren, so she's, she's going to team up. Great. Well, first of all, while she's getting that up, I'll, I'll offer that uh, I'm just a little awestruck and by Brad's presentation, it's a you know, in in the midst of all all the values and tradition that he talked about, which really are something to pause and consider. <clears throat> um, on top of that, it's a great illustration of of planning and implementation. So, I, <clears throat> in the topic of agriculture and <clears throat> the, the Great Salt Lake Basin, there's a lot going on, and I, I thought on putting this presentation together based on the agricultural water optimization program that's going on in the Great Salt Lake Basin. But I think, I, I felt that it was better to go forward <clears throat> with a call to action to engage the planning process. Because one of the things we're finding is that um, agriculture is not the only thing going on in the basin, of course. It's a big water user. But we're all in this together. So really, as we as we talk about 
optimizing agricultural water. Really, we're optimizing the, the water resource that's available in the Great Salt Lake Basin. So with that, uh, Marisa, would you go to the next slide, please? I have the sneaking. There we go. <clears throat> I suspect you're going to see them there before my internet connection gets it to here. But I'd like to start off with this story of agriculture because it's true in Utah and it's true across the United States. This is a, <clears throat> a, a product uh, published by the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Resource, uh, yeah, Ag Agricultural Resource Services. And what it shows is that over the time since basically post-World War II, that U U.S. agriculture has been able to produce increasingly <clears throat> greater output basically with inputs being level. The, the punchline is that farmers are doing more with less and farmers are accustomed to doing that. And that's going to be have to be our mantra moving forward as we <clears throat> work on Great Salt Lake and uh, you know, restoration of things to a safe level there. Let's go to the next one, please. This slide shows a different story. This is food production. Uh, in the excuse me, net exports versus imports. So if you look at the yellow line, that's imports. The green line is exports. And for decades, the U.S. United States agriculture has been kind of the mainstay of the export uh, balance of trade for the United States. But it's it's now become what a lot of people are calling a a matter of national security. I'm not just trying to play off of the 9-11 theme here, but this is something that uh, people worry, uh, you know, observers are worrying about because we become a net food importer. And <clears throat> the, the New York Times said this pretty well in uh, this excellent article run last year that pulling water out of the ground made it possible for, the, for America to become an agricultural superpower. But that depletion is threatened. And I think this, you know, we're, this speaks to groundwater, but the same is true for surface water. Let's let's go to the next slide, please. And this is a, um, and you know, we learned long ago <clears throat> that uh, groundwater and surface water are interconnected. Uh, I'm, oh, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but Texas is still working on realizing that. And California had to legislate it in 2014 to make it true for California. But what these show is that if groundwater is in distress, a lot of groundwater is used for irrigation, and you can use that as an analog or a leading indicator of what your surface streams are about. And in the in the big picture, uh, Tim, you like to use the word writ, the phrase writ large. I'm going to use it here. Writ large, what we see across the country is all of our major ag production areas are in critical drawdown uh, in the yellow and or orange and dark orange. Uh, I've in, in the job that I retired from, I had opportunities to go visit all of these areas. <clears throat> and I can tell you that the American breadbasket is in, in peril because of water scarcity. For example, in California, the Central Valley there, you can see highlighted in orange. Uh, <clears throat> when measured by value, the Central Valley contributes 50% of agricultural production in the entire United States. And of course, that's all based on irrigated agriculture. So in Utah, we're not that big as in, in agricultural terms, but it, I'm suggesting that in the, in the day we're in, that every bit of agricultural land counts. And as you know, Utah has been losing quite a bit of agricultural ground to urban conversions. Next slide, please. In 2015, Envision Utah undertook a study of, uh, if you remember there, uh, Your Utah, Your Future. They did a segment on agriculture and found that the Utah people had a 98% wanted greater food self-sufficiency, in other words, Utah production. And they were willing, uh, <clears throat> in the studies, in the, in the polling that was done, uh, two, two, actual, two separate polls actually, uh, one of the findings was that people said they would be willing to give up water for their lawns if it meant more water for agriculture. So we're, we're in something, of, I'll call it a social compact. Uh, from agriculture standpoint, we recognize that this 
enfranchisement of using water is an important stewardship and that we have to do it correctly, we have to do it wisely, we have to do it well. But if we, I, I'm, I'm going to, sorry, slip, slip into the um, object lesson mode. In this is a Great Salt Lake Basin peach. This one, I, I bought it at a fruit stand in Delta, Utah. This one is a peach that I bought at a grocery store in Delta, Utah on the same day. This one cost half of what this one cost. This one's from Chile. This one's from Orem. And that's, the point is, if we want greater self food self-sufficiency, we need to protect our Utah agriculture. And at the same time, we need to, we need that productive capacity. Let's, uh, next slide, please, Marissa. But there's some objective facts that maybe we, I'm going to start with the ones I think we can agree on. People need food. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll not further tie that to our discussion about sewage today, but we know that there are basic human needs and to address them. Is what Yes. The notorious Delta Wi-Fi connection. Warren, you still with us? <laughs> hey, you're back, Warren. We lost right. you at your first bullet. Okay. Well, let's see. I'm I'm still getting the picture, but you you're okay with voice, and you've got the picture. Okay. Yeah. Pe people need food. We, that's Maslow's hierarchy. We all know that. Farmers produce food. What I was saying when it cut out was that the average age of our farmers in Utah is, is in late 50s. Nationally, it's in the early 60s, 60-year-old. 60 so farming and farmers is, we're, we have reason to worry. We also know that farm production requires water. The question, I think, the opportunity we have, the thing that as I shift into talking directly, more directly about planning, the opportunity we have is to make sure that we're allocating water to the best ways to produce food. And I'm going to offer that we need to do our share in producing food. We can't rely on other places to grow our food. 98% um, of Utah people feel that way. So let's go to the next slide. We know the background of this. This, this, these. These are among the things that Linda Freitas has taught me. Uh, when Great Salt Lake's in peril, Utah's in peril, because it's our big sort of canary in the coal mine, if I can use that example. It's a mighty big canary. Um, but I would invite you to say when Great Salt Lake is in peril, Utah is in peril, to add and agriculture. When Great Salt Lake and agriculture is in peril, Utah's in peril, because those are leading indicators of our stewardship in managing water and other resources. So let, let's go to the next um, next slide. We know that we're on a budget. What, um, nature sets the budget. We have to live within it. So it really becomes a matter of optimizing that resource, optimizing the water resource. And we, we know the decline now uh, in, in the lake. And this chart shows it very well. But of course, there's more dramatic ways to illustrate that. And you've, you've all seen them. Uh, my, one that just makes me pause and <laughs> can't breathe is the, you know, the onslaught to our, our pelican population, for instance, is another such indicator. As we look at the depletions from the lake, we know that agriculture, there it is, is the biggest depleter of water, human depletion from the lake. The biggest one, of course, is natural evaporation, but we can't control that. What we can control is the human side. So how, how do we do that? Uh, next slide, please. And we do it through a planning. <clears throat> the, the first thing we have to do is plan how to do it. You, you heard the sequence of plans. Uh, Eisenhower said planning is essential, but battle plans are is, battle plans are useless. But planning is essential. And of course, the Mike Tyson one gets quoted quite a bit now. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Another, we're just waiting for the next punch in the face. The the you know, on our route. <laughs> grabs hold of us again, thank goodness for two good years. But the, the challenge that we have as stakeholders is that we do need to collaborate. Any one group planning by itself is no good. We need good data. 
I wanted to use this chart to illustrate that data. If you look at the lines, you see the total consumption, the top line there. This is from the Great Salt Lake Strike Force report. Um, the top line is total, total consumption, human, de human water depletion, what depletion from human uses. Top line in the chart there is agriculture. And if you look at that, it's about level across there. Uh, that is to say, agriculture is not using more water in Utah really than was used in 85. So that means something else is going on that we need to adapt to. Now, my first thought as we collaborate, the second one is we need to start with good data. And as we've worked with these data sets, uh, we, as we work with data sets, it's getting the right data to make the right decisions. So really talented data people tell me we've still got some work to do in, in agriculture because the number we're seeing there involves, uh, it includes diversions from the Bear River in Wyoming and Idaho. So the point being, let's make sure that as we make decisions, we're using good data and we understand it. We, we need to define outcomes and Brad's presentation just illustrates that so well. We need to develop a plan, uh, implement it, measure the results, and then repeat and go back and increasingly improve our approach to how we optimize the water resources available for Great Salt Lake. And um, the reason I'm making this pitch is because we all need to do it, agriculture included. One of the one of the interesting things that I, I didn't put a slide in on this, but there, there was an editorial in the Los Angeles Times in 2000. 14, as I recall, where they were responding to a claim by a lot of people that, um, by various commentators, that agriculture only represents 2% of the economy uh, in California. So why are we allocating so much water to California, and yet California is producing 50% of, of our nation's food? Um, so it's one of those things, I, I don't, I'm not arguing that agriculture is exempt or should not be part of the planning process. Indeed, it has to be. What I'm trying to do is extend an invitation that we all participate and make sure we're making those allocation decisions based on a full data set. And then I guess we have to look at what, what comes from there. Let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah. And in that respect, the, the call to action is that the Division of Water Resources is engaging in that 2026 statewide water plan. Uh, they, they are inviting participation from agriculture, and we're answering to that. And I think everyone needs to answer to that, frankly. We all need to engage. After all, it's a team sport. Let's go to the next slide, please. Tim, maybe you, you, you can... Uh, explained the genesis of this cartoon. You and I were there the day that, that launched this in our meeting with the Salt Lake Tribune editorial board. And I was delighted the next day when Pat Bagley came out with this cartoon. But the, the question is, uh, I, I hope that's not the best we can do for Utah water is 500, 500 milliliters. But we know that we're water short. We know that there's a lot of hands, there are a lot of people at the table and the the comment that was made that generated this cartoon probably is that uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So my my offer is that agriculture wants to be at the table. We'll provide whatever resources and information, so on, that we can. And that we're all... The, sorry, Marissa, I was reaching for my button to go to the next slide, but I'd better ask you to do that. We can't say it's somebody else's problem. That's just living in a state of denial. If you go to the next slide, please. All right, I'm guilty of being overly dramatic, but I really think that we know that Great Salt Lake is in apparel, that it's crisis level, and we've had two wonderful years of water to, to give us some breathing space to get our planning done. But I'm gonna suggest to you that, that not just Utah agriculture, but agriculture in general, also has to be part of that planning picture. So the next slide, please. Thank you for your time and indulgence. Yes, this is a photo of our 
Great Salt Lake taken from a house where I lived in Bountiful for a number of years until recently. And if you go one more slide, please. Uh, what, what that just illustrates is that, Marissa, I didn't give you the link to the latest version. <laughs> <laughs> the latest one is a beautiful sunset photo of a hay, of a hay derrick, which is a 120 year old technology that we can't afford we can't afford to use 120 year old solutions to to address our current need but farmers have demonstrated that they know how to innovate adapt to care and to survive and feed the world on top of all of that so uh, let's let's make sure uh, this this organization is the advisory council is a essential vehicle to the planning process that's now underway for Great Salt Lake. I'm, I'm delighted that agriculture has been added as a liaison to the, to the council. Uh, I hope to hold up my end of it and uh, Tim, pull the hatch during a time and replace me if I'm not, but let's get this planning done and let's, let's optimize our resource for the benefit of everyone. And thanks for your time. Thank you, Warren. Uh, many of you probably have the privilege of knowing uh, Warren, but if if you don't, uh, his uh, his talents are on full display there. He's one of the first people that I had the privilege of interacting with when I moved back to Utah and started working on on water uh, water law and policy. And you won't find a more thoughtful uh, or articulate advocate for water generally and ag in particular. So thank you, Warren, for that presentation. So two great, um, really substantive presentations from a couple of our liaisons that represent perspectives that really have to be part of the discussion if we're talking um, seriously about the future of Great Salt. So I'm grateful to uh, Brad and Warren both for taking the time to put those presentations together and that they're willing uh, to be with us on this journey. Now, I, I, as I am wont to do, I blew right past a couple of uh, very important uh, housekeeping items. Uh, one is approving the agenda, and second is approving the minutes from our meeting of July 10th. So for council members, uh, you've had a chance to resume the agenda. We're already well into it. Um, but could I get a motion from a council member to approve the agenda for today's meeting? Okay, so moved. We get a second. We got a second. Dina, thank you. Um, council members, all in favor of approving the agenda as drafted, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries unanimously. Also, you should have received copies of the minutes, which thank again, thanks again, Jim, for putting those together, Marissa, for circulating minutes of the July 10th meeting. Um, any additions or changes to the minutes? If not, can I get a motion to approve the minutes dated July 10th? Hey, Dina, thank you. Second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. Uh, any opposed? Uh, motion carries, the minutes are approved. So thanks for those cleanup items that I neglected earlier. We're now going to go to Marissa, and I teed this up a little bit earlier, Marissa, but let's go to you for a report on the 2024 GSLAC funded uh, projects. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, so this is just a report on the projects that the Advisory Council funded in fiscal year 24. And for those unfamiliar, the state's fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. So this would have been from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. So the first project we funded was the Great Salt Lake Enhancement, Enhancement Project Projects Project. I call it the Projects Project. It is a mouthful, but it is exactly what the title suggests. It is a project for projects. Um, this was a joint effort between the Advisory Council, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, and the Division of Water Resources. We contracted with SWCA to develop a database of implementation projects that would benefit Great Salt Lake. We gathered information from over 60 stakeholders on projects that could increase water delivery improve or conserve Great Salt Lake habitat or provide other tangible benefits to the lake. The list of projects can be used for funding opportunities and collaboration efforts to help Great Salt Lake in the shorter term. There are obviously future iterations of the database to come. For now, it is just a pretty Excel sheet that lives on all of our websites. So hopefully in the future, we can turn that into something more beautiful than an Excel sheet. Also in fiscal year 24, we contributed to the maintenance of the Great Salt Lake Hydro Mapper, which is created and managed by USGS. 
The Hydra Mapper is a web application that displays Great Salt Lake water levels and salinity data in a digestible and easy to use format. It links real-time stream flow, water quality, and water elevation data from USGS. GSLAC was also able to fund a tech team proposal in fiscal year 24 from Casey Root of USGS. Casey's work looked at refining volume and area estimates of Great Salt Lake for different lake level elevations. This data was integrated into the Great Salt Lake Hydro Mapper and will help Great Salt Lake managers immensely when determining potential effects of different South Arm lake levels. And you'll hear more from Casey very shortly today. Lastly, in 2024, the Advisory Council funded the Water Conservation Toolbox, as you will hear from Lily today as well from SWCA. The purpose of this toolbox is to provide municipalities and other local governments with the information and insights needed to optimize water conservation. The Advisory Council worked with the Division of Water Resources to complete this project as well. And I'll spare the rest of the details in lieu of both Casey and Lily's presentations. And then moving on to fiscal year 25, Tim already captured this a little bit, but we entered a new fiscal year on July 1st, which made that $125,000 available again. Um, currently, we have not contracted any of that funding, and we are looking for projects that will benefit our knowledge and understanding of Great Salt Lake from a holistic point of view. Um, I don't know if we have time to have that discussion now, but I'll say if you have an idea or ideas, um, never hesitate to reach out to me or Tim anytime. Um, we'd love to hear it. And that's all from me. Great. Thanks, Marissa. Any, that hopefully gives you a flavor of the kind of projects that we, we funded in the past. Pretty good sampling, right? Um, any questions from Marissa about projects we funded last year? Okay. And again, when we get to action, we can talk a little bit about whether we want to um, contribute some money to the to doing the study that was described that we already approved. Okay, uh, we're going to turn the time over to Tim Davis. He's our deputy Great Salt Lake Commissioner. Uh, we've we've made this a standing agenda item, and I'm deeply appreciative of the work that our Great Salt Lake uh, Commissioner Brian Steed and, and Tim Davis, his trusty deputy, who's been doing a, a ton of work on his own. But we're really um, grateful to Tim for the work that he's putting in, and he's here today to give us just a little bit of an update. So we'll turn the time over to you, Tim. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Tim. Um, so uh, I, I feel like I should be wearing a Robin suit uh, for, and, and have a picture of Brian in the Batman suit then with that introduction. But um, so I'm going to go over just I, I want to highlight um, s some of the many uh, amazing things that are going on for the Great Salt Lake uh, that are being done by state, federal, local uh, agencies, partners, uh, because the commissioner's office is more than just you know, Brian and me, um, it's really intended to uh, quarterback and, and help coordinate uh, the efforts of 12 different state agencies, five federal partners, a myriad of local districts, cities, towns, uh, and nonprofit stakeholders. So um, some of those activities that are going on, the many activities going on include, uh, just, this, uh, just this last week, the uh, uh, Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands and Compass Minerals signed a voluntary agreement that uh, I think the uh, 78,000 acre feet of real wet water that will be left in the lake uh, that could have otherwise been uh, diverted when the lake's below 4195 uh, is a big deal. There's also around 200,000 acre feet of uh, water that that compass could have grown into. So that's a, it's a huge step forward for the lake. Uh, other work that's going on is uh, the Division of Water Rights and Utah State University came out with a gaps analysis for water measurement uh, that's needed uh, across the Great Salt Lake Basin. Um, the Division of Water Resources is leading up three different, th this is only three of, of numerous studies of, as part of the Basin Integrated Plan. Uh, those include going back to Warren's presentation, agricultural uh, conservation and optimization. Uh, municipal and industrial conservation and uh, and dust research and, and mitigation. So those that, those are efforts that the Division of Water Resources are leading up, as well as I would have to say, uh, Director Candace Hossieger. She's also worked with her federal partners on uh, a, an MOU between the state and federal agencies to coordinate our efforts going forward uh, between the federal government and the and state entities. There's brine fly research going, uh, the Division of uh, Wildlife Research. They're out on the lake right now with legislators and others 
talking about Endangered Species Act work, uh, brine fl uh, fly research, uh, and other uh, research that's needed to, uh, for, for species that rely upon the lake. There's agriculture, the UDAF, the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food did a tour of agricultural water optimization projects just last week. Um, I was up there. There's uh, $40 million that's, uh, that's on the ground. There's another over $100 million of agricultural water optimization projects that are going on around the state. And then, uh, and then I'll, I'll finish here. And there's a lot of things I can't hit on because not enough time, but I just wanted to give people a flavor of how much is going on around the lake. The last piece I want to say, because the mayor's here, uh, is that uh, the uh, Great Salt Lake Watershed Enhancement Trust has been working with uh, Jordan Valley uh, Water Conservancy District, but also Weaver Basin Water Conservancy District to release water from Willard Bay, Willard Spur. That includes 1,500 acre feet from Ogden this year, as well as uh, water that's going to be released from uh, Utah Lake uh, to down the Jordan River to the lake. So this is a lot of amazing, great things going on. Going forward, picking up again, uh, Warren's uh, mon mantra to plan. Uh, the, uh, just about a year ago, Brian Steed and I uh, began working on drafting up the Great Salt Lake Strategic Plan that was approved by the governor at the end of last year. We committed to coming out with a more detailed plan uh, by the end of this year. And that, we're working on that actively. Uh, the three, that's gonna be focused on three main levers to get enough water to the lake, uh, to get the lake to a healthy range in that. Those are uh, baseline annual conservation. Um, and so we're gonna be identifying, we're working with Dave Tarbotten, Utah State on analyzing what, what amount would make a difference. Um, and then working with water right holders, uh, water users across the basin to voluntarily get water to the lake through leasing, optimization, conservation, and make sure that water is delivered and dedicated to the lake. Second one is working really closely with Division Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, Salinity Advisory Council and others on uh, berm management between the North Arm and South Arm. How do we manage uh, salts and water between those two? Um, we learned a lot when the berm was closed. Um, and so going forward, how can we more adaptively manage that? Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands just put out an RFQ uh, to, uh, for an engineer solution. Uh, for the berm itself. And then the last is how do we maximize, work with water districts and others to maximize uh, wet water years, getting enough water to the lake, getting more water to the lake when, when uh, we have mana from heaven and uh, you know, Mother Nature has given us uh, extra water. We can learn a lot from these last two wet water years. How do we maximize that going forward? So I'll, I'll stop there. I plan to come back to the council uh, to with more details on each of those three levers in that plan. Uh, before we finalize it at the end of the year. Happy to answer any questions. Hey, thanks, Tim. Yeah, and one of our statutory, part of our statutory responsibility is to advise or interact with uh, with the Great Salt Lake Commissioner's Office. And um, we're running a little bit behind on time, but is there any burning questions for Tim before we excuse him? Hey, thanks, Tim. Really appreciate making the effort to come out and provide that update for us. Hey, we're going to go to two reports on um, projects that have been funded. So we're now going to move to Lily Webb. Wetterlin um, to talk about the Great Salt Lake Conservation Toolbox. Um, Lily, welcome and thank you. Time's yours. Uh, well, they're teeing that up. I can uh, just sort of points of interest, but I think kind of harking back to Brad to your presentation. Um, a lot of people don't know it, but there's teepee mounds no less than a mile just this way. Um, and the research out on uh, Promontory Point shows human history dating uh, at least 13,000 years people have been living and foraging in and around Great Salt Lake. Some of the most uh, impressive rock art um, I've ever seen. So there's really a long, long history when. When, when Brad talks about the Shoshone's a real long history tied to the lake. So, okay, Lily, looks like you've got your slide presentation teed up. So go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Lily Wetterlin. I work with SWCA Environmental Consultants as a water resource scientist. Yeah, Lily, can you get a little closer to the mic? I think we're having trouble hearing you. Is that better? Better. Okay, perfect. 
Um, so today I'll be presenting on the water conservation toolbox project that we developed with GSLAC. Um, just to begin, I'd like to thank GSLAC, the Division of Water Resources, Utah Waterways, and the Weaver Basin Conservancy District for their time reviewing and responding to questions during the development of this report. Today will be a very brief overview. This is a pretty intense report. Um, I'll provide a link at the end of this presentation so that you guys can all take a read. So the primary objective of this project was to develop a water conservation toolbox designed to help cities and municipalities meet their conservation goals. This toolbox serves as a guide, creating opportunities for municipalities to succeed in water conservation by building on previous work, such as the Utah's Foundation Report, work by Utah Waterways, Utah Growing Water Smart, Conserve Water Utah, and many more. MNI conservation is crucial for achieving statewide water, water conservation goals. Even though MNI is a small, smaller percentage of water use compared to the agricultural sector, all sectors of water use need to participate to meet conservation goals. Utah's population is expected to double by 2060, with most of the growth occurring along the Wasatch Front. Without effective conservation measures, the demand for MNI water is also likely to double. However, our existing supplies are not. Without water conservation, we risk public health, economic decline, and an already declining Great Salt Lake. Therefore, creating resources for municipalities and cities to guide conservation efforts is essential. The development of the toolbox utilized resources and collaborating with various water conservancy districts, public utilities, the Division of Water Resources, Utah Waterways, and many more. The toolbox includes three tools. The first tool focuses on indoor and landscape ordinances with model ordinances included as appendices in the report. The second tool is a series of example rate structures. And the final tool is outlined landscape incentive programs. These tools are designed to be customizable, allowing cities or municipalities to tailor them to meet their conservation strategies and their specific needs and goals. The first tool presented in the toolbox is a landscape ordinance. The purpose of the ordinance is to establish a legal framework for conservation practices, ensuring that municipalities adopt and enforce water conservation. A key component of the toolbox is a table that outlines low, moderate, and high water conservation standards, providing municipalities with flexible options to start their conservation efforts. Um, on the slide, this is just a visual, um, very simple visual representation of the how, yeah, how the table provides this information. As you can see, as we increase from low to high conservation standards, the percentage of allowable grass decreases. The entire table follows the ordinance line by line, providing these different options. The model landscape ordinance and the appendice represent the moderate water conservation standards, which were developed using the requirements to qualify for the landscape incentive programs provided by Utah Water Savers. These ordinances are applicable to residential, commercial, and public properties, ensuring comprehensive coverage. The conservation tiers outlined in this report are designed to provide municipalities with easy entry points into water conservation practices. However, to live within existing supplies, it's essential that all municipalities eventually strive for that highest tier of conservation. Next in the toolbox, we discuss indoor ordinances. The indoor ordinance incorporates standards required under Utah's plumbing code. These standards are compared with EPA water sense standards and California standards. The comparison highlights where Utah standards align with or exceed national benchmarks, as well as opportunities for improvement. However, currently municipalities in Utah are not permitted to enforce water efficiency standards that are more stringent than those set by the state of Utah. Therefore, the model ordinance provided in the appendices outlines the highest level of conservation allowed within those limits. The next tool in the toolbox are example water rate structures. Water rate structures are a principal tool for promoting water conservation. The toolbox outlines different types of rate structures, including tier rates that change, um, that charge higher prices for higher usage levels, flat rates that remain um, constant regardless of consumption, and seasonal rates that adjust based on the time of year. To illustrate these concepts, we developed example rates for various types of communities, including urban suburban areas, rural regions, and those using secondary water supplies. These examples provide a clear visual representation of how different rate structures can be applied. 
The rate structures complement the ordinances by creating financial incentives that encourage adherence to water conservation guidelines, ensuring a comprehensive approach to managing these water resources. In the toolbox, we also outline existing pricing rate structures relevant in Utah. Um, this is a figure on the right. We highlight the application of various pricing strategies which show variability that likely reflect, reflect differences in local socioeconomic conditions, attitudes, water scarcity, or cost of infrastructure. For the purpose of the toolbox, the variability in the existing rate structures means that the potential to meaningfully modify water consumption by adjusting rate structures is highly likely to vary across water providers and that the examples in the toolbox need to be reviewed before adoption to ensure it meets um, community needs. The final tool in the toolbox is outlined landscape conservation or conversion incentives. Uh, landscape incentives play a crucial role in a comprehensive water conservation plan by encouraging property owners to replace water intensive landscapes with drought tolerant alternatives. Our report outlines three different types of these programs to support these efforts. First, we outline monetary rebate programs that offer financial incentives for landscape conversion with examples from Utah and other states. Um, and then second, uh, we outline free or discounted landscaping materials program that pro provide essential resources like drought resistant plants and efficient irrigation systems at discounted or reduced costs. Um, that further lowers barriers to adoption. Lastly, we discuss incentives for municipalities to adopt these programs, ensuring that um, local governments are motivated to implement and promote uh, these water efficient landscaping practices. Together, these incentives cre create a robust framework for achieving significant water savings and foster sustainable landscaping practices. So to meet conservation goals, implementation of the incentives, water rates, and ordinances are much more effective together than uh, separated. These tools can create synergy, so the ordinances create a mandatory baseline for water conservation, ensuring that all properties meet minimum standards. The landscape incentive programs make it financially feasible and attractive for property owners to go beyond these minimum requirements. Um, by adopting water efficient practices. The water rates then provide ongoing financial incentives to maintain these practices, ensuring long-term adherence to conservation goals. Each element also reinforces the other. For example, a property owner who receives a rebate for converting their lawn will also benefit from lower water bills due to the tiered water rates. And then they are legally required to comply with the landscaping standards set by the ordinances. This integrated approach um, ensures that the water conservation is addressed from multiple angle, angles, regulatory, financial, and behavioral, creating an effective strategy towards water conservation goals. So m and con water conservation is crucial in Utah due to its arid climate and rapid urban growth, which places significant strain on limited water resources. Effective m and conservation helps manage this demand, support economic activities, and protects the long-term water availability for the state's residents and industry. The tools in this report cover the recommended practices outlined in the Division of Water Resources 2015 Regional Water Conservation Goals re Report, such as uh, conservation pricing, indoor fixture conversion, improved irrigation efficiency, and water-wise landscaping. Overall, the toolbox can be used to help achieve the proposed regional m and water conservation goals. With that, I wanna say thank you again for GSLAC and all of you having me today. Um, this was a really fun project. We had a really great team of um, water economists and uh, city planners that helped me build this report. Um, it is available on the Department of Environmental Quality's website. If you just type in the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council activities, it's the first one that will pop up. And I can take questions if there is time. Okay, I think there probably is time for a couple quick questions. Uh, Lily, thank you. My first reaction is, Orem City, say it ain't so. That's, you know, the state legislature passed a law that says you have to have a tiered rate structure. That's as close as you can get to a tiered rate structure that isn't a tiered rate. It's like a flat line. It goes up a penny for every. Okay. Um, any questions for Lily? Great work. Uh, great presentation. Any questions for Lily? Yeah. In public. Oh, I was going to let Leland answer that. 
Lily, do you want to do you want to tackle that one? It's a complex question, um, but not so complex when it comes to Great Salt Lake, as Leland has already hinted. Yeah, I would say I'm not the right person to answer that question. Leland, would you like to answer that? Could you guys repeat the uh, the question yeah. online? Yeah, we thanks, did not Trevor. Hear that. Yeah, because that was a question from the public, and that was, does reuse M and I reuse count as conservation? Fair statement. I think in terms of the toolbox, it's not addressed particularly in there, but in terms of actual water getting to the Great Salt Lake, uh, if you're going to do reuse to a source, to a use that's being lost, then it's not conservation. We're talking about real conservation to drive water to the Great Salt Lake. So it has to reduce the overall usage uh, in real gallons not recycled gallons. Yeah, in that conception, reuse really becomes kind of an enemy, right, to Great Salt Lake because so much of the water supply that goes down there is actually reuse. Um, any other burning questions for Lily? Yeah, Dina? I don't have a question necessarily of sort of what is what is expected to happen with this report with regard to the policy implications or the policy suggestions. Um, I just had two, it was interesting to me when I read this that the state standard, Utah state standards, um, oftentimes are not as robust as others. And so I'm wondering if there's a possibility for the legislature to consider the moderate income housing plan as a model for water conservation um, efforts of the city. If you know the moderate income housing plan is a structure set in place that gives municipalities options to achieve their moderate income housing plan. You're not, we're not forcing them to do one or another, but they have a series of things that they have to say, I'm gonna try this, we're gonna try this, and we're gonna try this in order to encourage affordable housing production. It seems that two things, if the state would be willing to allow cities to seek a more aggressive standard, that they should be allowed to do so. And perhaps the state could create a framework like the Moderate Income Housing Plan for cities to allow them options to achieve conservation goals and just report that back to the state every year. I don't, I don't know if sort of what's the next step. This is a great tool. We sent this to the um, Utah League of Cities and Towns to share at their convention, and I think we'd like to pursue that further with them, at least my speaking on behalf of the county and the, the cities within the county. But it seems like the next step, logical step, would be to suggest some frameworks or framework that might be supportive between what the state is trying to achieve with regard to conservation and what the cities um, are able and might like to do or want to do. Just a thought. Thanks, Dina. Good suggestions. And there are actually some forms and mechanisms to kind of do that with the governor's office of just sort of economic opportunity and some of the ways that, that, that things have been structured to maybe suggest some of those for consideration by the legislature, because some of those are policy moves. Lily, any, would anything you'd add in terms of next steps, in terms of how this gets out there, gets to the cities or anything there? Um, I think it would be great to have some next steps. I definitely think some like educational components and, you know, getting that actually distributed instead of just posting it online would be, yeah, amazing. Thanks, okay, Leland's got a comment. I am H O. Uh, I believe that we should probably look seriously at using some of our available funding for the 25 fiscal year to pr produce a, a, a program to roll this out to municipalities and actually take it to city councils um, as the first step in, in introducing it to other folks. Uh, you know, if, if we are not taking bold steps as the council to say, we need people to look at conservation seriously, then who is? And, and, and so when you look at a low, medium, and high, if you went back to that slide, our, our studies suggest that, and that talks about front and side yard, our studies suggest that we need 50 plus conservation on grass in the entire yard, which means the front and side yard are gonna be even less grass. And so we need to take a bold step and say that this is something that municipalities should adopt. And if they don't adopt it, then it's more likely to go back to the legislature and say, now we want to try and force it down their throats. Unfortunately, they tried that a few years ago and it didn't work very well. The League of Cities and Towns were very strongly opposed to it. And so it would be good to get this information out to the municipalities so that they can then help understand their role in trying to conserve the Great Salt Lake. 
and this is a, a these are salient steps that they can take you know this is like shame on you if you still have a park strip with grass in it and you're in this room today you know is yours good it's flipped okay good happy to record i don't want to embarrass tim again i mean <laughs> not again it's easy to do leland <laughs> but um we need to we need to we need to get that message out and say this is what's going to be necessary to say to great salt lake and here are some tools that you can utilize so i think we ought to be putting together a budget for a project to have a contractor in conjunction with possibly folks from the state but also could be members of the council to go to municipalities and make these presentations Thanks for that suggestion, Leland. Duly noted. I think we should put that in the hopper. Um, let me just say, just to kind of put in perspective of the folks that are here, um, preliminary estimates from a Division of Water Resources are that the amount of acreage in turf grass, so just ornamental turf, just for the Great Salt Lake Basin, so not statewide, but just for the Great Salt Lake, is 150,000 acres and if you do the calculations for water associated with that um, just some significant conservation in that space would go a long way to closing some of the water deficit gaps that we see at great salt lake that alone okay thank you lily we really appreciate the presentation okay and we're going to turn it over next uh, we've got casey root from usgs to talk about well it's a big mouthful something to do with topographic data we're going to turn it over to Casey to interpret that for us and not have me try to do it. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Second, I got it. Yeah, we've got some transition here. Um, I see a comment in, uh, from Jamie Huff in the comments. It's to Dina to really your suggestion. Um, you know, there's a limitation. You know, is there a way to maybe revisit that requirement that you can't go higher than the state standard? I think it's a fair discussion. And I think some of the things you alluded to, Dina, should be discussed, right? If cities want to go more aggressive. Why shouldn't we let them, right? Local control is the mantra. I would say local, everyone's for local control until they want to control the locals. Right? Okay, Casey, we're going to turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. All right, uh, thanks for having me to, having me here today. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to get to, to present this data. Uh, this will be redundant for, for many of you. I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, but hopefully I do, I do a better job at this time. And, and for those that are new to this, um, I'm really proud to, to present um, this, uh, this data that we released the, the last year. Uh, and so today I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the... Uh, the data set that we, we put together, repurposing topographic data to standardize volume and area relationships in Great Salt Lake. Yes, that is a mouthful, uh, but the, the idea is, is we use some pre-existing uh, survey data to, um, to, to basically set a new standard for, for how much water uh, we believe is in uh, Great Salt Lake, as well as the surface area that it covers. Uh, and so uh, the USGS, uh, so sorry, I'm, I'm Casey Rue, I'm, I'm hydrologist with, with the USGS. Uh, and so the USGS legacy is mostly uh, tied to stream gauging and, and monitoring, at least on the water side. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is another way for us to contribute uh, data to the public uh, to, to add to this foundation of, of data that goes into to monitoring uh, Great Salt Lake. And so from my part in, in, this, in this story, uh, I mostly worked in southern Utah and Colorado River hydrology, um, but uh, the last couple of years as, as uh, Great Salt Lake uh, decreased in level, uh, I started hearing whispers around the office, uh, namely from, from the remarkable Christine Rumsey, who does phenomenal work modeling uh, for the USGS on, on Great Salt Lake, that uh, amid the, the myriad of, of uh, projects that she has going on, that it would be great if, if she had you know, this, this table that she could work off that had high resolution volume and area estimates. And so this is just a, a short list of, of projects that we have going on in our office, um, including salt cycling, nutrient mass balance, uh, salinity, um, water balance modeling, 
uh, and and we're going to be breaking into some uh, some mineral extraction studies as well as as uh, some dust studies that are going on. So this this data set that that was requested kind of came out of a, a position of need for our office for for the work that we were doing, uh, and so we had this opportunity to to put this together for our work and then ultimately uh, for the public uh, to use as well. And so. Uh, what was available to that point, there have been estimates of, of volume and area in, in uh, Great Salt Lake for, for years. Um, uh, but in, in 2002, uh, Rob Baskin recently retired of the USGS. He did a bathmetric survey of the entire lake, uh, driving the boat up and down, back and forth, uh, to produce a couple of reports, uh, uh, including the tables for area and volume. Um, and that was the standard for, for a time um, and it's recently become outdated, uh, and, and since then, uh, David Tarbutton has uh, uh, published some of that data in a more usable uh, digital format on the, the HydraShare uh, website, um, but it still didn't quite fit the bill for, for what we needed. And so just to kind of reflect on, on the, the time uh, that, that we kind of broke into this, this conversation of, of producing this data set, um, here we have uh, the footprint of Great Salt Lake in April of 2020, uh, when it was at nearly 4,195 uh, feet in both the north and south arm. Um, and then uh, the footprint in red of October 2022, so just a little over two years later. And, and so uh, this is using data and, and images from the data set that I would go on to produce, but uh, you can see uh, the the actual uh, footprint of the lake was down about 20% in just those two years. And even more striking, the, the volume uh, decreased about 35% uh, in just over those two years. So, um, you know, it, that, that those, are, those are big numbers and, uh, and that'll, that'll catch a lot of attention. And so we have this graphical representation of what this looks like. And just from a, a shortwave infrared uh, satellite photo is what it kind of looks like in, in reality. Um, and so this just kind of, again, became a, a, something that, that was born out of necessity. And so going back to those, um, those surveys that Rob Baskin did for the USGS back in the early and mid 2000s, uh, he surveyed the, the South Arm uh, between 2002 and 2004. Again, he was in a boat for months going back and forth, up and down in a single line um, to, to get as much coverage of, of the lake as, as possible. Uh, and then he did the north, uh, the north arm in 2005. Uh, this is an enormous undertaking, um, and and uh, you know I've always been very appreciative that that Rob had the patience uh, to to go about doing this. Um, and so he did this survey. Uh, the lake at that point in time allowed him to do the survey up to around I think it was 4189 in the south arm, 4190 in the north arm. Uh, and then all the topography in the data sets above that was uh, just placed in some, some USGS contour maps that were available at the time. Really low resolution. I think uh, the, the resolution was around 30 meters on, on those maps. Uh, but the maps that he produced had one foot contour intervals of, of the bathymetry of Great Salt Lake. Uh, and then he produced a couple of reports to go along with the surveys uh, where he had tables uh, at uh, half foot intervals for area and volume. Uh, and so these reports, they were released in 2005, 2006. So they predated uh, modern uh, publishing methods that, that the USGS uses right now. Uh, so we have a website called ScienceBase. That's where we put all of our data. Um, and uh, what Rob produced was, was PDF reports. So in the grand scheme of mapping, there's limitations to what we can actually do with that, especially nowadays, with respect to, to using it in a, a geospatial information system, readable uh, format. Uh, so there's the, the second part of, of the data set that we put together um, uh, in, after the, the bathymetry was uh, LIDAR that was flown by the state in 2016. And so it's only 10 years later, but the, uh, the advancements in, in, uh, in technology, especially when you don't have to deal with the water, uh, it, it, it's really apples and oranges when you compare the two data sets. Um, and so the state uh, flew this LIDAR. Uh, and and it's you know just beautiful data. Um, they they have uh, two different parts of it that that are uh, half meter resolution uh, as well as one meter. 
Um, and what's best about this is, is they flew it when the lake was at a then historical low. So they got as much real topography as possible. Uh, and so I always like to, to tip my hat and pump the tires of the, the Utah Geospatial Resource Center. They do a phenomenal job of, of reporting all of their, their uh, GIS uh, data and uh, they make it really easy and, and accessible for, for someone like me to, to go and, and use and, and pull in, and put into to good use. And so moving on to the methods of how we put this all together, uh, it really, in the grand scheme of things, it, it, it boils down to two data sets and finding the right way to put them together uh, into something that's, that's usable by modern, by modern uh, uh, methods. Uh, so in the blue ovals, we have we start with a contour bathymetry map, again, starting from a PDF uh, into a, an interpolated three-dimensional uh, raster for, uh, for combining with the already three-dimensional LIDAR that the state did in 2016. I don't think you put that last batch in at all, but where we can, no, they're not there. Where we can get it is Walmart. Hey, we need to, if you're online, if you could mute your mic, we're getting somebody's private conversation. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Um, so you have these two data sets, you assimilate them, you, you basically stitch them together into a, a seamless and, and continuous uh, topo bathymetric data set. And from there, you can, you can play around with volumetrics and, and produce these area and volume tables. And so just in briefest terms, in the bottom left, that's uh, Rob Baskin's uh, bathymetry map, starting off of, as a PDF. He's able to, to save uh, some of the, the source data um, and uh, 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 basically he can sa save me a step of having to transcribe it from PDF into a, a vector format, into a GIS format. Um, and in this top picture here, I just want to highlight the, the difference between where the bathymetry uh, uh, contours are versus where the, the USGS contour uh, mapped were in red. So everything in red was not real bathymetry. That was, that was other data sources that he had to pull. Uh, but from there, having the contours, you can just run it through uh, a tool that, that Esri um, has on their, their ArcGIS platform, uh, topo to raster, and, and uh, develop a, a nice three-dimensional image of, of topography in, in the like the bathymetry. And then from there, like I said, the, the LIDAR is already ready to go. Uh, you just uh, make sure that, that everything's talking to each other the right way. Um, and I'll just take a, a moment to, to say a word on, on datums because at least in my line of work, datums are, are a big deal, especially when it comes to Great Salt Lake. Uh, the elevation records that we report uh, at Saline and Saltaire uh, are in a 1929 vertical datum. And that's because that was the, that's the legacy of, of those, those sites we've been reporting for over 100 years. Uh, and so when Rob first did the survey uh, for bathymetry, he also used 1929. And in modern methods, you always use the, the most modern datum. And so the state LIDAR in 2016 uses the vertical datum in 1988. So... Uh, to give perspective, uh, you know, the difference between these two at, at three locations, Saltaire, Bridger Bay, and Saline, uh, it's up to three and a half feet. So that's not insignificant when it comes to Great Salt Lake. That's a lot of water, actually. And so just making sure that everything was, was kind of kosher and, and, and talking to each other the right way was important. And so um, after everything was was assimilated and and stitched together then that's the point where we can actually start doing the the calculations to get the, the elevation area and, and volume relationships and uh and so uh when it comes to these raster uh images uh of of topo bathymetry or, or digital elevation models in general uh they're made up of pixels and so little tiny squares uh put together and you know the dimensions of these squares uh, the X and Y, for instance, in the, the final topo bathymetric uh, digital elevation model was, was 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. And each pixel represents uh, an elevation. Uh, and so again, through Esri, they have a, a tool where, where it just automatically goes through and accounts for every single pixel uh, at or below a given elevation. And so we did this from, from bottom to top in the data set at 0 0.01 foot intervals. Um, and uh, and so that that really just kind of is, is the gist of, of how we got to, to our final tables, um, which look like something like this. Uh, and so this is part of the, the data release that we did 
uh, for uh, uh, this work. Uh, with the red headers is the elevations in both datums for ease of use. Um, in the blue, uh, the area with all different units and, um, and same with the, the volume in green. And really, we just try to make this as, as usable and, and user-friendly as possible. Um, and so, you know, these tables uh, are great for someone using the data. And, uh, and so, you know, I'll, I'll take umbrage with something that Marissa said. I, I love spreadsheets. I love looking at this kind of stuff. Um, but maybe this is something that's more useful for, for at least visualizing. Uh, this, is, this is that data in graphical format. Um, it's uh, the curves for volume and area. Uh, so the solid lines are uh, volume, uh, dashed lines are area. And for volume, uh, you're using the bottom x-axis to go from left to right increasing. And for area, uh, increasing from right to left um, with the north arm in brown and, uh, and the, the south arm in green. And so this just kind of gives you an idea of, of how and where different levels of the lake uh, may increase uh, or decrease in, in how much uh, water you gain or lose or, or how much area you gain or lose at, at specific elevations. Um, and so one of the, the takeaways I always try to, to, to drive home with, with something like this is that for every inch that you gain, it takes that much more water to, to get above it. So, you know, it's always great when, when we're, we're increasing elevation, but for, in a volumetric uh, uh, point of view, it just it gets that much harder to keep going upward. Um, so one of the big things with, with repurposing some older data like this uh, is to make sure that uh, you have your, your error uh, constrained. And so, again, we're using old contour maps, interpolating it, and hoping that it lines up with, with something that's modern. And so for the, something like the 2016 LiDAR, we, we, we kind of treat that as, as the ground truth. That's what we compare off of. And, and um, there are, the errors on, on LiDAR are, are much, much smaller than something like the telemetry. Um, and so, uh, like I said, uh, Rob was able to, to get a little bit uh, higher up in, on the banks on the north arm. And so what this image shows here is just the, where the overlap was between his bathymetry and the LIDAR in 2016. And we just ran a, a random point analysis on that overlap to see what the difference was between the two data sets. And for the north arm, where there was a greater um, uh, sample uh, or the greater space to, to pull data from, uh, the average difference was seven centimeters between the two data sets, which is, you know, that's a couple inches. We're, we're extremely happy with that. Uh, median difference is nine uh, centimeters. In the south arm, it's, it was a lot tighter to the, to the shoreline. And so the error there isn't nearly as constrained, but the same methods were used in both. So we feel very confident that, that it's actually probably closer to the, the north arm uh, rather than the, the 50 some odd centimeters that, that uh, the difference is in the south arm. And so in that vein, um, just a quick um, word on, on accuracy versus precision, uh, especially since we're, we're comparing these two data sets, which are very different. Uh, on the left here is a, a hypothetical cross section of any any given uh, topography. Could be, you know, Great Salt Lake, uh, where you can have highs and lows. So let's say the microbial, you have the top versus the, the the space in between, and so that's actual topography. And, and modern lidar or or bathymetry will capture all the nuances and 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 um, real topography that's there. For something like an interpolated bathymetry data set. It, it basically smooths through uh, all the all the details, um, but at the same time, it also comes out to be accurate in the in the grand scheme of things. Once you start accounting for you know millions of acres of uh, of water, um, and so with regard to to the usability of of data like this, um, uh, you know we, we feel at least for the time being, this is this is going to be very helpful for, for doing the mass balance work that we, we uh, have been working on. And so uh, the, the data release includes the topobathymetric raster um, and uh, some spatial metadata to define where the data came from, uh, as well as uh, elevation area and volume tables. So that's going to be from top to bottom, the area and volume for, for every uh, 0 0.01 foot uh, interval. And so that's all been uploaded and uh, published on, on the USGS Science Base uh, website. And, uh, and it is now available on the USGS uh, HydroMapper uh, web app. 
Uh, and so what this looks like, maybe hopefully some of you are, are familiar with this uh, website. It's been a great tool for us to, to reference quickly. Uh, but these top two graphs have been on our homepage, on the, the HydroMappers homepage uh, for some time. We've added the, the area and the volume to the bottom of those so that when you're looking at, at where the lake is, you also get a good idea of, of where the area and the, uh, the volume is at as well. And then on another page, uh, just another way of, of seeing this data pop up, there's a little bubble that pops up when you scroll over the, over the time series um, and you know, including the, the lake level, it also has the, the area and volume for that particular day and lake level. And so uh, kind of in conclusion, um, this data set uh, has been really useful for, for us in our work and in our mass balance models. Um, and uh, it, it works wonderfully for lake-wide comprehensive uh, studies uh, as, as well as uh, water budgeting. Uh, what this isn't really great for is if you're interested in, in the uh, microbial lights or details and the geomorphology of, of the, the lake floor, uh, you're still gonna miss some of those, those details along the shoreline. Uh, the good thing is the, the state is, is doing the LIDAR bathymetry uh, along the shoreline right now. So hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to, to put these all together and have the best of both worlds where, where those details in the, uh, the shoreline are really pulled out with the new, the new data set. And uh, there's nothing stopping us from, from just doing this in, in a few years when that's available and, um, and just adding in the better data as it becomes available. Um, and so, uh, with that, I'd just like to thank uh, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands for, for making this possible, for letting us get this published, and, uh, and also all the great work that, that um, some of my colleagues at the USGS, uh, they do. Uh, Hannah McElwain, she had that picture on the, the previous uh, page, but also some of our great hydro techs, and um, uh, Andy Carlson, he's been doing some, some phenomenal work on, on the Great Salt Lake the past year, Erica Rao, Destry Devesti, and uh, of course, Christine, and, and Scott Heenick as well. So it's a collaborative effort and uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks, Casey. We probably have time just for a couple of words about asked in the comments about whether the data set includes Farmington and Bear River Bays. You have a response to that? Yes, I have a hidden slide, hold on. Sneaky's got hidden slides. Did that go? I got to reshare one second. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Wayne. So uh, we spliced the the data tables into. There's a, a full uh, lake-wide area uh, volume elevation table, uh, but then we also separated it into the North Arm, the South Arm, uh, Bear River Bay and Farmington Bay. And so this image just kind of shows the delineation of where those are. Um, and then the Carrington and, and Gilbert Bay, that was that was more for our purposes because we, we separate the two in some of our studies. But yeah, it's all it's all separated so that you can kind of add it together, subtract it from each other and kind of make it fit your needs. Great. Thanks, Casey. Just high level context. I mean, isn't the idea really that by having this better resolution, it'll actually inform management and conservation or restoration strategies right because you'll have a better idea about what you need kind of where things are at and what's needed exactly and and even comparing it to, to previous estimates for for volume and area um it's always surprising you, you look back at some of the old papers and they weren't that far off uh but it's just about making sure that we we use the the best data to get the best available estimates awesome thanks yeah joe one more, last question from joe would you, would you say the previous um surveys just in general, would they have underestimated volume or overestimated volume? You spoke about precision and accuracy from an XY standpoint. But. I, I I'm not sure of a, of you know if there's a systematic you know overestimation or underestimation. It'll always be off by a little bit, especially when when you know it's like when Rob did those reports. They're at half foot intervals, and we're going down to 0 0.01. So you know even interpolating those two points in the half feet, you know, there's a lot of room for for difference. So. You know, the, the idea is, is trying to make it as, as usable as possible. Tim, there, there's a, separately, there's a, uh, an effort with water quality, not to get too far over my, head of my skis with, uh, with Jim sitting here, but, um, you know, there's, 
House Bill 453 mandated um, better monitoring from the mineral extraction companies uh, of what's discharged back in, in terms of effluent and TDS and you know mass load and whatnot. So this is great to have a, an updated, accurate data set that'll definitely inform that process. Yeah, thanks for that question, comment. Joe, and, and thanks, Casey. Appreciate you being here, and thanks for taking the time to put the uh, information together. It's great. Great for the lake. Thanks for having me. Okay, we've got, um, we're a little bit, running a little bit long on time, but we, we historically we have two things kind of left on our agenda. One is um, we'll open it up in here just a second for public comment. And then after that, uh, kind of open mic for, um, for council members or liaisons, anything that you would like to bring to the council's attention. It's going to be events or just things you think we ought to consider, or as Leland did a little while ago, potentially something we should think about for funding. So right now I'm going to open it up to uh, public comment from members of the public. Is there anybody that has a public comment? Lynn? Thank you, Tim. Um, I just want to extend an invitation to all of you. Uh, to join Friends of Great Salt Lake on October 3rd as we celebrate 30 years of our work on behalf of Great Salt Lake and its future. And it's about all of us. It's not a 30-year celebration of just friends. It's the fact that it's taken all of us to accomplish what we've been able to accomplish today. So um, we celebrate you. And we want you to be there and just have a great time. So uh, information is on our website, FOGSL. And I'll look forward to seeing you on October 3rd. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn. Quite a legacy, 30 years. <laughs> a lot comes at you fast. But thanks for all your great work. Um, other public comments? Yes, please. Um, find the mic so and make sure you introduce yourself so online people know who you are. Okay, so just a reminder, my name is Maria Monker, and we are doing that planting event like Bla Bradley Perry mentioned earlier with the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation, and I brought a flyer. I am also able to email that out if anyone online would like me to send that your way. We invite the public to come out and volunteer. We've opened it up to two separate days because of what Brad mentioned, where we're trying to plant 50 plus thousand trees, and last year we we're grateful to have the 10,000 go in with our 400 volunteers. So just want to welcome you and you can take a flyer up here at the table if you'd like. Thanks so much, Maria. Any other public comments? Tim, I had a quick, yeah. quick one. Um, just so you all know, the Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands is in the initial scoping phase for the Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake Comprehensive Management Plans. Um, and you should expect to receive invitations for both public and stakeholder meetings this fall. Those dates and locations are currently in the work, so just keep on your emails. Awesome, thanks, Marissa. Any others? Any online? Hey, Tim, this is Adam Wickline with the Great Salt Lake Watershed Enhancement Trust. I just wanted to give a quick plug for our wetland grants that we are administering with Forestry and Fire State Lands. I'm just gonna put the website in the chat here and hopefully you can share that with people in the room. Awesome, thanks, Adam. If you're aware of wetland projects, that's a really great opportunity. Um, any other, but anyone else online? Okay. With that, I'll close the public comment. We'll come back to the council uh, and or liaisons. Um, any, anything that hasn't been referenced that you'd like to bring to the council's attention, ideas for projects or future agenda items, complaints, criticisms, any of that? Tim, I have a question actually for Marissa. It's a logistic Gina, go question. ahead. Yes. So the funding, the, the 125000 from the Brian Shrimp royalties, right? Where have we put out the RFP for those? It's, not, it's not through an RFP process. It's oh. basically we just mm -hmm, okay. kind of handle but informally. What's the timeline? Can you lay out the timeline for when those proposals will be submitted or when those are accepted? And um, Yeah, so with that fund, um, like I mentioned, we have it per fiscal year. So it becomes available July 1 and it lapses on June 30th of the following year, we can contract and allocate that funding throughout the entire year. Um, it just has to be spent before June 30th of the end of the fiscal year. So um, in the past, we've had Great Salt Lake Advisory Council projects come to us at the beginning of the fiscal year, toward the end of the fiscal year. We don't have to use it all at once. 
it is kind of a rolling basis, but you know, with these longer projects, it is better to get them contracted sooner versus later. So I guess it's just a rolling call for proposals that you can accept at any time. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's Correct. What I, was I think we'll we'll think as a criteria moving forward to making sure people can spend it right before the end of the year because we don't want it to lapse back like it did this last year. Leela. And that's sometimes extensive. So if you don't start the project soon, like right now. Leland, can you make your comment in the mic, please? Sorry, Leland, can you grab that mic? And I just said you got to get going soon because it takes a while to get it contracted. Okay. Thanks. Is um, from from council perspective, is there a, a desire to move forward with? Uh, I think we have kind of it's a live request, really, to. Uh, fund maybe up to the level that we did last year or something along it, it would be obligating 26,000 out of that 125 if we did it um, to the study that we were talking about for is, is there that's really this um, this mineral study and the breach um, if there's interest it might might be valuable for us to get the council's approval to move forward on that one can we do that today if it wasn't i don't know if we have if we noticed for that if these sort of actions and follow-up would fall under that category so that it's appropriately noticed for this meeting yeah i don't think uh, we're subject to that in quite the same okay. ways we can do it if we want to is really the question if people want to think about it more that's fine but if the if we're we're leland looks like he has something to say. i think I'll leland make... and i would like to see it happen i would i hate to see that a contracting delay would result in us la not getting the research done so Go ahead, Leila. I, I think we can do that because there is an agenda item to discuss this, and I would make the motion that we approve that. And, and what, to just to be clear, uh, Lena, what to fund it to which amount? The amount that we approved previously up to the amount we approved previously or something along those lines? Up, up to the amount that Tim said he wanted to fund it. Okay. So I know this this will be like people will be like what you're doing. Um, meeting last week in Rome with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations brought together um, people from terminal lakes all over the world. And uh, you might wonder, well, why why do they care? Why are they concerned about Great Salt Lake? Um, since the 1970s, the FAO has been concerned about Great Salt Lake because of its role in global food supply. So the brine shrimp harvested from Great Salt Lake. Um, are 50 percent of global supply five million metric tons of high quality protein sort of reliant on that if you if you took away brine shrimp for example you took away the aquaculture that relied on it just the terrestrial impacts would be immense to try to replace that protein would be immense so one of the things that's interesting in that setting is we had people from kazakhstan uzbekistan china russia um, all over the world, if they have terminal lakes, they were there. And when they look at Great Salt Lake, they're like, oh my gosh, Great Salt Lake, that's that's like uh, the Emerald City. I mean, they've got everything. They've got people engaged and they've got legislation. They've got Great Salt Lake advisory councils. They, they would love to have um, some of the resources that we've seen here at Great Salt Lake. That's, so that's one of the messages. And I just want to say it's an attaboy for 
add a girl for everybody that's here. Thanks for being engaged in this really, really critical, um, well, this, the struggle to, to protect this critical resource. Um, and the second rather sobering thing is it's, it's we don't want to screw it up, right? Because um, the world really is watching and sort of looking to Utah for solutions. Fortunately, we have some partial answers there, but still a long ways to go. So thank you all for your engagement in that. And with that, can I get a motion to adjourn? Dina, thanks. A second? Hey, Megan, a second. Uh, all in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.